Greetings and welcome to another Insight Project video. Welcome, welcome. Our village is yours, Mr. Spock. So, in this video, um, well, really, I've been waiting for some reed switches to, to get here because I, I need them to go back to doing stuff with the rotor. But in the meantime, this is something I may have shown before, but I I wanted to just try and show it more simply and more concisely. So we're going to discharge one cap into another, and there's one way that you do it, and you get one value. And there's another way that you do it, and you get a much bigger value. It's not exactly subtle. And so we'll show that in this video. But I guess, you know, it's probably worthwhile to, to put in the context and background. So I guess, you know, the first thing is, what is a capacitor? So a capacitor is just a means for storing electric charge. And so you have two conductive plates with an insulator between them. So then one plate can be positive and one plate is negative. And because you got the insulation there, the hot side stays hot and the cold side stays cold. So it's, it's a little bit um, like a very small battery, whereas batteries store charge electrochemically, capacitors store them electrostatically and so for one like this the the two plates are are all like jelly rolled together and that lets you hold a little more charge but I mean compared to a battery it's just a tiny amount of charge so the first thing is if you discharge one cap into another what's it supposed to do I mean what's the normal answer um, so if this cap is at 10 volts and this cap is at 0 volts, here's the two negatives connected. If we connect the positive, what do they go to? Well, it's um, it follows, well, actually, it follows that guy's law, Ben Franklin. It's um, Ben Franklin's law of conservation of charge. And so because of that, it's like um, if you had two equal size glasses and one's full and you connect one to the other at the bottom, then they both end up half full when the water equalizes. So it's the same thing going on here. And so we'll just do one of those real quick just to confirm. Okay, so here I've charged this cap to, to 10 volts. And then when I take this line, that'll disconnect from the power supply and connect it to here after I remove the short then this cap will discharge into that one so now I just move the meter over to here you get a little bit of cap rebound we'll get rid of that now I'm going to take this off the power supply and charge uh, discharge the 10 volt into 5 4.86 so again the two caps are obviously a, a little bit mismatched in terms of size um, but within, you know, within a, a couple or a few percent, Ben Franklin was right. Yay, Ben. So in a minute here, we're going to discharge a cap the, the cool kid's way. And when you do it the cool kid's way, you get a lot more charge out. But before we do that, we're going to do one more thing, which is to discharge a smaller cap into a larger one. So now we're going to do the exact same thing, except for this time we're going to discharge a 10 UF cap into the 1000 UF cap. So this one's much, much smaller, so we know it's not going to equalize at 5 volts. And we also know that, per Franklin, charge needs to be conserved. So now we need to, so the, you know, the charge that you start with has to be the charge that it ends with after the two caps have equalized. So now we need to know what is the charge in this cap and the charge in a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. Q equals CV and the unit of charge uh, you generally use a Q but um, it's it's called a Coulomb, sort of a silly name, um, but it was named for um, Charles de Coulomb, a, French physicist with a C. Um, so Q equals capacitance times voltage. So let's just throw that in a spreadsheet real quick. So if we just throw this in a spreadsheet, we know Q equals CV. So 
our capacitance in cap 1 is 10 microfarads and the voltage is 10. So our charge is 10 times 10 or 100. In this case, because this is microfarads, it would be 100 microcoulombs, but we'll just call it 100. Cap 2 is 1,000 microcoulombs, but the voltage is 0, so 1,000 times 0 is 0. And this is the initial state, so the total charge is equal to 0 plus 100. Now when we connect the two, still a 10 and a 1,000, but what's the voltage and what's the charge in each? But we know it has to equal 100 between the two of them. So it's just a little bit of algebra. And, you know, the, the easiest way to think about it is just this 10 volts, <clears throat> excuse me, is initially, you know, he's living in a little 10 square foot apartment. Uh, it's kind of stupid, but you get the idea. He's confined to 10 microfarads. Then you connect them in parallel, and now he's got room to, to spread out. He's got the 10 and the 1,000. So now this 10 volts that was stuck in 10 microfarads of capacitance can spread out over 1,000 and 10. So if you take 10 divided by uh, 1,000 plus 10, 10 divided by 1,000 and 10, and then times it by the voltage, that'll give you what? the voltage will end at for both of the caps. So 10 divided by 1,010 is 1 divided by 101. So equals um, 1 divided by 101 times 0 0.09901 and because the two caps are connected then the other one's at that too. So did that work? Now let's figure out what the charge is in each cap. So the charge is again equal to C times V boom times boom. There's that much there. Let's just copy and paste this. Don't warn me about that in the future. So 99 in that one, 0.99, let's add them up. So equals this plus this. 100. Yay. So now you know how to predict what the value of any two caps will be if one's discharged into the other if you know the capacitances and the initial voltages of each. And the predicted value is just under 0 0.1 volts. So this isn't really rocket science. I mean, this cap is 1 one hundredth the size of this one. And so when you charge this to 10 volts, it goes down to just about 0 0.1, just under 0 0.1 because it spreads out over both caps. So the power is on and we have 10 volts. It's sitting in this cap. This cap has the meter on it, and it's empty. So I'm going to disconnect the power from, from here. And just to show you, kaboom, 0 0.099. I actually saw like a 0 0.1 for just a second, but okay so that was fun but now now we're gonna make two simple changes and we're gonna get a drastically different value so let's make the first change do it again and then make the second change and do it again it's not till the second change that you see the the different value so now we have the the coil and wire the coil of wire in place connecting the negatives. Power's on, meter's on here. This is charged to 10 volts. Take this off and we're going to connect it to discharge now. Exact same as before. Darn you, Ben Franklin. You're always right. And now we're going to make one more change 
and we'll introduce this guy, which is a silicon rectifying diode. And it's kind of hard to see, but on one end of this, there's a, a white band. And what that means is that power can flow from positive through the white band side to negative, but it can't flow the other way. And so I'm going to put this in the same orientation as this one. They're both 10 UF caps again. In fact, just to be, I'll move the diode over to there so that we know it's the exact same cap, just to be extra special. Um, so I'm putting the diode to block the flow from positive to negative. And, you know, someone might be, you got manure for brains, boy. The cap has an insulator between the, the two conducting plates. And, and so that's why it, they, it's there to store, you know, the positive and the negative automatically. All you're doing is like blocking it again. And in this case, there's a teeny, teeny, teeny amount of leakage that happens through the diode. And so, you know, it's like all you're going to do is over, you know, a few hours or a few days, the cap will leak out through the diode, even though it should be perfectly blocked. So now I move that diode onto the same cap we were using before. And this now is, this is the cool kid's way to discharge a cap. So this is shorted, take that off. That cap's sitting at zero, we're at 10 volts. I'm gonna remove the power, which is going to here. So this is at 10 volts. We're going to, boom. And that's the result. 0 0.34, I think it was. Do it one more time for you. So I shorted this cap out, sitting at zero. This is charged. Taking this off. I'll just look right at the meter the whole time now. I'm discharging it. Ow. Yeah, 0 0.34. So we discharged a cap into another, we got 0 0.1, predicted as that. We discharged a cap into another through a coil, we got that. And then with this one simple trick of putting this diode in, in that configuration, we got almost three and a half, 3.4 times more charge out, and, and I did it twice. Now the other objection might be, well, maybe somehow the diode means that the two caps didn't balance out to the same value. Um, and you think about it, you know, 10 volts led to 0 0.1. So for this to go to 0 0.34, this would have to go to like more than negative 20 volts for, for that to end up there. This is going to be hard to see because this cap's going to drain out real quick. But let's just do the same thing and we'll try and look at what's in this cap this time. Okay, I don't have the meter hooked up yet. We'll hook it up in a minute here. So this is charged. And power's on. Oh, that's shorted. Okay. Cap is charged. Going over to here. Discharged it. Now, let's see if we can see what's in this cap. Zero point three four four. So the the issue you have is that this is an, an extremely simple closed system, and in one case we got zero point one volts, and in another case we got zero point three four volts. So that's no longer following conservation of charge. Sorry, Ben. Now people might say, "Well, no, oh, you cheated, Ben." Let me just kind of lay this out for you. This is maybe 50 cents. This is maybe 50 cents. That's a dollar. This is probably 10 or 20 cents. So you're up to a buck 20. You actually don't even need any coil of wire will do. And even if you just have a line through there, you're still going to see something, but it's much more dramatic if you put in an inductor. And any inductor 
pretty much will do. So any any bit of wire, magnet wire, you might have lying around. So that's a few bucks. And if you don't need a power supply, just get a nine volt battery. You'll see the same thing. And it, if you don't have a multimeter, you can get one for 20 bucks. So, uh, you know, ballpark 25 bucks, you can do this. Amaze your friends and neighbors. So again, this is one, you know, it's like, you know, don't take my word for it, just do it, it's easy. Um, now, you know, not to be school marmy, that's a word, but, um, you know, your mission, if you choose to accept, why did this happen? He has found the final secret. <laughs> I'll say, you know, I'll kind of give it away here. This happens on the power grid every single time there's step down transformation of voltage. So I've sort of given it away, but you have to think about, you know, where is the current flowing? Where where are the current flows and why did this work? Um, and then, you know, the the other thing though, well, there's a few things. I mean, first is, you know, does it grind corn as the saying goes? I mean, you could actually do some stuff with this. Like say you had a flash bulb um, in a camera that's discharged real quick by a capacitor. When you go to recharge that capacitor, if you repeatedly did it this way, now the effect becomes less dramatic as the two caps begin to equalize in voltage. So I'm giving it away a little bit more there. So when this one is at nine and this one is at 10, you're not gonna see any excess voltage, but you're still going to get the normal discharge per conservation of charge at that point. And so I've done this, you know, I've done this on a breadboard there. You know, it'll charge up to 10 volts for maybe 40% less charge. So the batteries in your camera would last about twice as long, almost twice as long, and you'd still get the same, just as bright a flash every time. So that's, um, there are some things that you can do with it, but it's not, you know, that this is something that happens all the time. But what I'd say is useful about this simple setup is that, as I said, it's a closed system and you can see that that's not really following conservation of charge. Now, when you think about it, you know, people will then say, oh, okay, I get it. I, I see why it's happening now. And there is that level to it, but, you know, if you lean back and scratch your balls for a minute, eyeballs, scratch your head for a minute, sorry, then, it's, you're still stuck with where did it come from? And to go even a little bit further on that, the conventional model says that there is a mass associated with the smallest unit of charge. An electron has mass. And Coulombs, oops, Coulombs, you know, one Coulomb actually equals a set number of electrons. So if, that, if that's the case, then you got out 3.4 times as many electrons and 0 0.24 of those, where did they come from? And did, do they have mass? I mean, there's, there's not supposed to be massless charge. So did they, did they come in from the neighboring town? Did they come in from some, let's call it a luminous vacuum? <laughs> Were they created? Were they just created? And now that, that would give the more conventional people, I think, something of an anaphylactic reaction, even more than saying it's from a luminiferous ether. But it's there and anyone can see it and it's a closed system. So you are still stuck with, even after you understand kind of why it happened, um, you are kind of stuck with, well, where did it come from? So, you know, I mean, the textbooks always present everything as all neat and tidy and there's 0.01% that still needs to be, you know, like worked out. But when you scratch the surface even a little, it's, it's a lot more 
kind of active sort of debates. I mean, just to give sort of one example, it wasn't that long ago where people were saying, you know, well, there's a particle of light. Is there also a particle of heat? And you know, initially, it's uh, stupid. What a dumb question. Everyone knows that it's the average velocity. But, you know, if you back up a little bit, how silly of a question is it? Now, I don't think there is a particle of heat, but it's not like a crazy, you know, absolutely absurd question. There's particles of light. Maybe there's particles of heat. I forget they even had a name for it. Um, and that, you know, I mean, that was like 100 years ago or something. Newton had it right, Isaac Newton, uh, back when, you know, 400 years ago. He was saying it's the average velocity. I agree with Newton. Generally a good idea. Um, so there's that. And, and this is something anyone can do for themselves. And on one level, I understand it. And then on another level, it's, I still, you know, it's still mysterious. Um, but it doesn't seem to follow conservation of charge very well. So I got the read switches from DigiKey. So um, next video, I'll be back to, to spinning a rotor. I'm kind of, I don't want to say fixating, but I'm starting to focus now more on spinning stuff than this stuff. Um, so we'll look at changing the, um, the pulse width. I actually have an improvement to the rotor from uh, like two, three videos ago now that I'm eventually going to get to, but I'm going to do it stepwise. And then after that, there's a couple rotor designs. I mean, one's going to be finally going back to a window motor, but there's also another rotor design that I'm going to, um, to look into. So that, I don't know, that'll probably, I don't know. I mean, I'd maybe by the end of August, do all of those, but it might be like three months or something. Well, let's see. Anyways, I hope people enjoyed this. And um, now you have a a simple party trick to wow your friends and neighbors. So God bless you all. Stay healthy.